Hebrews uh, chapter 10 today, if you want to look and put your finger in a, in a slot for something. Now, <clears throat> how many of you, I'm curious, are basketball fans? You would call yourself a basketball fan. Wow. There's a, you are definitely a minority. <laughs> Well, we're going to try this illustration then anyway. <laughs> Some of you, uh, you're going to find this fascinating history that you never knew existed. Uh, and some of you, are, it's still not going to matter after this, <laughs> after this point in time. So I don't, there was a, there's this basketball game, like a title game. The neighbors to the south here, one of their teams in Kansas won the college National championship, the Jayhawks, I guess, they, they played really well against the other team for, I think, a series of games, or I don't remember how all that works. You can tell I'm a major basketball fan also. Um, but they won this, this game, and yet the game that we watch today, <laughs> I guess, that we're, or that we don't watch today, <laughs> uh, it doesn't really look like it began. Did you realize that? Uh, it was actually, I forget the guy's name, I couldn't pronounce it anyway, but originally the game of basketball was in the 1800s. Uh, a guy was charged with the task of being able to keep athletes somehow active during the winter months in between other sports. And he was charged with this task to come up with a game to accomplish that. And they wanted it to be a safe, low-contact activity so as to not be injured uh, for potentially their other sports that they were in on other seasons. And so originally there was no dribbling of the basketball in basketball. You couldn't dribble the ball. You had to just catch it and then throw it. Now, if you've played basketball, you know your, co your coaches make you do this drill where as soon as you get it, you have to throw it to another open player because it's all about ball movement, and the faster you can move the ball and pass the ball and catch the ball, those are key elements to the game today, um, as well as like the only thing you could do back then, because there was no dribbling. Uh, there, there was no uh, basket. In fact, they made peach baskets, if you understand the, the wooden or wicker type of baskets without a bottom. Those were the baskets. They were set at 10 foot tall, just like they are today. But you can imagine the pace of the game when you throw a ball into a peach basket and then have to get a ladder out every time to climb and get the ball and then put it back into play. Really made it slow. Uh, today, we're used to five players on the court, but at one time, they allowed up to 50 players on each team, as I understood, uh, on the basketball court. I can imagine that didn't really work out well. I don't know how long that rule was allowed or how long it lasted, but uh, yeah, that was, that was one of the rules at one time. The ball hasn't always been a bright orange, but because they needed a way to help make it a little bit more visible, they decided, hey, let's make the ball orange. The point system was not what it is today. That Originally, there was no three-point line. Um, in fact, the very first game recorded in college history was December 21st, 1891, and it had a score. What's, what's, like, there's a professional thing going on, too. Like, what was the score of the last professional basketball game? Anybody know? Why does anybody know? Nobody watches the sport. So, I mean, it, it was, I, I don't know what the score is, but I've seen scores in the hundreds, one to nothing. One to nothing. That sounds like a hockey game, a hockey score. I mean, that's, that was the score. And so uh, there's been, from the beginning inceptions of the game that we know today as basketball, there have been a number of changes to the game. Now, I mention and say all of this to describe this process that Hebrews is going to look at, I would say that you could, we still call that game, even in its beginning form, uh, basketball. It was a foreshadowing of the game that we know today. Um, it's, 
or vice versa, however you want to look like. That started it, and then it, it is a foreshadowing of what we know today. It's, and I'm saying and suggesting that there could still be changes in the game of basketball. They seem to happen, well, rule changes every year in any sport, and it changes the game, what it looks like, but it's still the game of basketball. It's still the game of whatever it is you're looking at, and so uh, it, it's, it's still going to be called basketball. Now, all of this, <clears throat> again, is an illustration to help bring about this point that there's other things that we know of in one way, but are just a foreshadowing of another in their final form or in their form that we know today. And so Hebrews 10 goes again to continue this comparison between the old covenant and the new covenant in Christ, and you'll see the term foreshadowing being used quite a bit, as we have in 8 and 9 and 10, and uh, we'll move kind of away from that here a little bit when we get into 11, but from the beginning of the study, you'll remember that all of these things uh, that we've talked about, the angels, the prophets, the priests, the law, uh, even their worship what worship looked like to them, which is going to be a little more of a theme today, the worship that they pursued and experienced under the Old Covenant was but a foreshadowing of the worship and the processes and the practices, the faith elements that would come underneath Jesus Christ as Messiah. And all of this is still significant because at this point in time, again, they're trying to, the writer is trying to answer this question of, is Jesus worth following? Is faith in Christ necessary? Is it important? Those disciples needed to know that even though uh, things were maybe changing for them, it still was what God was doing. And especially in their time, if it meant their life, pursuing and following Jesus was worth everything that they would face. And I would say the question still is pertinent for us today. Now, for us, it might not be a life-threatening situation for us today in most instances when we talk about following Jesus and answering this question, is Jesus worth following? In fact, I think while it becomes maybe a little bit more increasingly more pressurized to say that you're a follower of Christ and there's a little more fallout, or there might be some more persecution, per se, in our region, uh, really, we need to answer the question, is Jesus enough? Is he worth following, even when there's something more fun to pursue? Even when this looks more enticing? When this pattern that the world is presenting, it, it, it makes sense, right? Logically, this is okay. And yet everything that we do in life and practice points others to whether or not Jesus and his ways are really something we're going to adhere to and follow. And so that's what uh, we're going to kind of look at today. Now, if we're uh, just kind of before we get too far, if you check out from like in the next couple minutes till the end, this is what you need to know. The sacrifice of Jesus Christ has sufficiently dealt with yours and my sin. There is no other person or thing that has sufficiently dealt with sin. And your response to Jesus' all-sufficient action makes all the difference, not only for this life, but eternity. That's, that is the main point of today. And so if you happen to check out or try to focus on the comic on the back or start playing tic-tac-toe with your neighbor or something other else, you know, your phone buzzes and, and you check out. That is the number one thing that you need to know. Jesus Christ has sufficiently dealt with our sin, yours and mine, and there is no other person or thing or process that has sufficiently dealt with your sin. And our response to that truth makes all the difference. Now, the second element that is extremely important is that the writers, I see them dealing very specifically with their worship practices. The, the thing for them that meant that they were following God and worshiping Him. And I think we'll, uh, and what that looked like for them in life and in practice. And so we're going to see, I think you'll see these things as we move through the first 
just 18 verses of Hebrews chapter 10. And so let's, uh, let's start reading. If you brought your Bible, you can read along in whatever version you brought. The English Standard Version will be on the screens behind uh, me, and uh, you can read along with us. It says, For since the law has but a shadow <clears throat> of the good things to come, instead of the true form of these realities, it can never, underline that, It can never, by the same sacrifices that are continually offered every year, make perfect those who draw near. Otherwise, would they not have ceased to be offered since the worshipers, having once been cleansed, would no longer have any consciousness of sin? I mean, this one verse unpacks everything that I just said and everything that we've studied and everything that summarized what they were doing under the old covenant law. I mean, it summarizes us right here. And and he's saying, he's starting to use this like, okay, let's just say if it was this, then they continually do it year after year after year after year. And it's not that it was worthless. It's not that. But it was just simply a foreshadowing. It was the beginnings of God's design for his people in worship and interacting with him and helping them come before him and respond to his sovereignty, respond to his his leading. It was just this response that the people had, which is really what we do in worship. It's responding to God. And this is key as we think through this especially in pertaining to worship and what they were doing in worship. So this law is a shadow, and what they did was it speaks of the code that was, I mentioned it a couple weeks ago, Leviticus chapter 16. I didn't go into depth. I'm going to give just a few more things uh, to that. You can turn to that if you want and read through it while I'm kind of summarizing it. If you want to write it down and read it later, Leviticus chapter 16. But in verse 2, God tells Moses to warn Aaron not to come into the most holy place. Well, not whenever he felt like it anyway. He was supposed to come one time a year. He could only come on this special day once a year. And well, if you decided, well, but I want to do that. I just, I mean, I want to I want to do I think it'll be a good thing if I come in and offer a sacrifice maybe a couple times a year or five or six times a year like right? cuz more's better. God said one time lest you die. I mean that's this is what he said. And it's a very specific standard for worship here, isn't it? And I I think that's a, an important note also mean but it pointed to their understanding of how Sin would be dealt with, and so, man, if you were to think through this process, let's just do it more and more and more. Let's just have somebody standing there all the time just to make sure that we're covered, right? And God says, no. One time, this specific way, that's sufficient. And as we continue through that chapter there, we'll see that Aaron was supposed to bathe, put on special garments. Well, I mean, if that's good, I'll just spend the rest of our lives in the shower, right? That's Just keep going through it. More is better. And then they were supposed to sacrifice a bull for a sin offering for himself and his family in verse 6 and verse 11. The blood of the bull very specifically was to be sprinkled on the Ark of the Covenant. Aaron was to bring two goats. One was to be sacrificed uh, because of the uncleanness and rebellion of the Israelites and that we see that in verse 16. Its blood was supposed to be sprinkled also on the Ark of the Covenant. The other goat was used as a scapegoat. We use that term today, you know, whenever we're going to shift blame to someone else. We come up with what's called a scapegoat. Did you know that term was biblical? It is. It's, there's a lot of things in our society that is actually founded upon Scripture. Imagine that. And yet we want to get rid of it. And we don't. Uh, there's a lot of people who want to get rid of it. But here we see this, this idea of the scapegoat. This goat was used, Aaron would place his hands on the head of this goat, and he would confess over it the rebellion and the wickedness of the Israelites. I don't know how long that process took. Maybe he just had like a, 
and everything else kind of clause. I, I, I don't really know exactly what that process looked like, but this is the scapegoat scenario. And, and so then they would take this goat, and one man was charged with leading it outside of the camp to be left in the wilderness. And on its own, you would assume that, well, a wild animal would find it because it's a weak, defenseless goat. Um, maybe it would find itself starving to death. The idea here was that the sin left the camp, and it would no longer return to the camp. But there was a problem that our, the Israelites, they came up with, they're like, well, how do we know? We found a goat out in the wilderness. Uh, maybe that's still the same goat. So they actually, tra tradition tells us that they started to tie a red cord to it, and then they actually found out that the goats did make their way back into the cities. And so then they started this tradition where we can't have sin coming back into the, into the city, into the camp, right? So they would actually take it out to a hill and they would shove it off the, the cliff um, and uh, just to make sure that it couldn't return. Now, the goat itself carried all the sin of the people which were forgiven for another year. And so this is what Hebrews is referencing there, that practice of worship, especially the Day of Atonement. And so while there were daily offerings as part of their worship, daily sacrifices in the temple that was offered, there was also special days uh, that they would celebrate, and there were specific, specific sacrifices. But this one specifically has with it them, it says, the reminder of their sin. It would remind them of the cost of their sin. It would remind them of God forgiving their sin. And this is what worship looked like for them. This is what their, their practicing of faith looked like for them. How many of you can say that's your story? <laughs> you know, we, we get up today, we're looking forward to this year. Yep, two goats are going in, one's coming out. One goat's leaving the town and never to be seen again. We're looking forward to this day. We're looking forward to the celebration. Now, it was some fascinating things that are extra biblical, meaning they're just found in external writings that I find significant. And let me state this up front. They're not scripture. They are written down as maybe historical or some other form of history. And so they may or may not be completely accurate. But I find them fascinating. There was tradition. There was a tradition that said they would actually tie a red scarlet cord to the doors of the temple after they did this process. And over time, we they said that the scarlet cord would turn white. Which, man, if that's true, that's that's interesting, significant, because another visual reminder of God cleansing them from their sin. They were pure. Uh, there's also a, a, a tradition that says that the actual uh, place where they began to shove those goats off of the hillside is the same place where Jesus had to escape and walked by the power of the Holy Spirit through the crowd when they were trying to push him off a cliff. Whether it's true or not, I guess I can't say for sure that it could be very accurate. But I, I say that just to say um, that in all of these things, the word of God has given us enough to support the fact that Christ is enough, that Christ is the risen Lord, the Messiah, that the Jewish people were looking forward to, that all of the prophets and the Old Testament law were a foreshadowing of, it finds its fulfillment in Christ, and yet if it's true, we see just again continual symbolization and visualizations of just God shouting from the rooftops, I'm present, I'm amongst you. Um, it's uh, significant. But again, all of this goes to support the idea that as we look forward to Jesus Christ and all, everything the writer of Hebrews has spoken of and taught to, Christ's sacrifice was sufficient and eternal. No longer was the blood of bulls and goats what God desired. It states that for us in the, in the passages that we're reading today. Or even wanted, it says. 
And yet here are these Jewish believers seeking to return to this way of life, it seems, and worship practices. And so when we look at the next few verses here, speaking specifically of the sacrifices and worship practices being a foreshadowing, we see the writer continue. It says, but in these sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins every year, for it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. This was very important for them. It is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Now, I think if I was looking into our modern day kind of application, it is impossible for your check or giving to take away your sin. It is impossible for your church attendance to take away sin. It is impossible for your good deeds to take away your sin. Only Jesus Christ has the power to take away our sin. And yet so many times we find ourselves trying to go through a process to earn forgiveness. When all that God had set up was to remind us of the cost of sin and that God is dealing with it. At verse 5 says, Consequently, when Christ came into the world, he said, Sacrifices and offerings you have not desired, but a body have you prepared for me. And burnt offerings and sin offerings you have taken no pleasure. Then I said, Behold, I have come to do your will, O God, as it is written of me in the scroll of the book. Now again, verse 3 takes direct aim at the processes of dealing with sin. He speaks specifically about this process that doesn't actually take away sin, but really is set there for the purpose of giving the people a reminder of their sin. I found in uh, one of my commentators a, a, a summary, really, of this whole concept. It says, when people remember sins, they either repent, as we see in Deuteronomy 9, verse 7, or else persist in sin, right? So whenever you're faced with this reality that I am in sin, there's two responses. Repentance, which is a turning away from that sin and lifestyle or whatever action it is, repentance or Head down, plowing through, don't care. <laughs> Those are your responses. Now, he continues, he says, when God remembers sin, he usually punishes it. When he pardons, he can be said not to remember sins. The author then is using an expression that reminds us that Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me as he established a covenant in which the central thing is that God says, I will remember their sins no more, which is a reference to Jeremiah 31, which we will look at, or I'll give you an opportunity to look through again because the writer is going to bring this up as we go through this passage. And so while in the past, the people and their worship practices required blood of bulls and goats, Jesus comes and states, these things God does not take pleasure in, and he even says, but this body that you've prepared for me, this is, this is, uh, this is going to accomplish more than, than what those could. It was a foreshadowing, but this is the fulfillment, and it's been written about. It's been proclaimed to us. This is not just some secret that God just finally said, hey, let me in on your little secret that you had no clue on. This is something that the people would have been aware of. Uh, Psalms chapter 40 actually gives us a glimpse of this. It's uh, Part of this uh, is a direct quote from that. It says in uh, verse 6, In sacrifice and offering you have not delighted, but you have given me an open ear. Burnt offering and sin offering you have not required. But then I said, Behold, I have come in the scroll of the book it is written of me. I delight to do your will. Oh my God, your law is written within my heart. Remember those words because we're going to read about those in the next few verses here. So Jesus takes it further, not only dressing the heart of their worship to actually bring about the completion of what the old covenant sacrifices were insufficient to accomplish, and that he, through his own body and sacrifice, were able to accomplish. He did it willingly, and it was all to bring about the will of God. And so in verse 8, he says, when he said above, you have neither desired nor taken pleasure in sacrifices and offerings and burnt offerings and sin offerings, these are offered according to the law, then he added, behold, I have come to do your will. 
He does away with the first. Here's the explanation. He does away with the first in order to establish the second. And by that will, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Once for all. What did I say uh, earlier? Do you remember the main point? If you forget everything else, if, you, if you're not looking that Jesus Christ, all-sufficient sacrifice is enough, there is no other element that can deal with our sin. This is why Jesus is worth following. Our response to Jesus' all-sufficient action makes all the difference for our lives, not only now, but for all of eternity. And the writer of Hebrews is just clearly pointing this out to us. No longer was this worship practice, this reminder of sin, this need for forgiveness, a yearly thing that they had to experience or that they got to experience. Sin had been dealt with once and for all. Now, what's interesting is that in the New Testament, when we talk about communion and remembrance, we just did it. And we, as a practice, we do it every week because the scriptures tell us as often as you meet together, do this in remembrance of me. And so when the body, when the church gathers, we take an opportunity to remember the sacrifice for sin. Remember that Jesus has dealt with sin. And we get to respond to that weekly. As often as we gather, we remember Christ's all-sufficient work on the cross through communion. And that's just part of what it looks like for us as believers in Christ, in our worship practices and, and how we live life. But our writer continues, if we look at uh, their practices, again, the compare and contrast mode, he says, every priest stands daily at his service, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. Now, I want to pause there for a moment because we see this continual daily processes that the, that the the priests, the Levit Levitical priests had to go through day in and day out continually. And they would do this at a constant pace and position, standing, walking, moving. They, it says they stand daily at his service, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices. Now compare that to what Christ did. He came one time offers himself the single sacrifice and he completed the work and he signifies it by sitting down. What do you do at the end of the day when you're just, you finish the work? Sorry, cameraman or person. <sighs> right? You sit down. You rest. And then you wait, <laughs> wait for the next, next action that needs to be taken. And for Christ, that next action that is taken is when the Father, God the Father looks over at Jesus to his son and says, time to get up, time to go get the church. I mean, that is, that's what the, the writer of Hebrews is really focusing the, the believers there to hold on to in faith and practice. Don't, don't go back to the worship practices that you were used to as a kid that you, that you grew up with that over and over and over and over accomplished really just a reminder of something and didn't actually take away sins, but Christ himself has offered himself once and for all. He's dealt with sin, and then he sat down and we know the gospel truth that one day God's going to say, it's time to get back at it. Go get your church. And this is what the disciples of Jesus taught. This is what was 
believed upon, that was confessed upon, those early disciples. And so we believe that this is what the, the readers of Hebrews were, were struggling with. Like, but I, I know what to do over here. This is familiar. We're all guilty and know what that's like. We like the familiar. We like to just kind of check the boxes and do what we're used to doing because it's, it's easy. Even if it's hard, it's, it's easy because it's familiar. And, and remember, remember the Holy Spirit that, the, that was promised to these disciples to continue this teaching that Jesus would leave and he would go and he would be seated at the right hand of God, but he would send one that was greater the Holy Spirit, to live and dwell in us. Remember, remember that promised Holy Spirit? Well, he, he shows up here in Hebrews 10, verses 15. He says, and the Holy Spirit also bears witness to us for after saying, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my laws on their hearts and write them on their minds which is not something that he spoke right then and there to them in that day, but something that God had spoken, that the Holy Spirit had spoken long ago in Jeremiah. And then he adds, verse 17, I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more, for where there is forgiveness of sins, there is no longer any offering for sins. Now, Again, the whole process of the Old Testament covenant law and how it worked and the scapegoats and, and, and all of that, that might be somewhat unfamiliar to us, might even be brand new. But for the Jew, the Israelite, and they have heard these from the time they could even begin to comprehend that they were listening. <laughs> it's kind of like if you grew up in the church, well, when, did, when did you start going to church? Oh, I don't remember. I've just been coming since my parents were dragging me along. That's how it's been. This is what it would have been like for those Jewish believers. They, were, they, they understood these practices and this worship process. But they were ultimately looking forward to the day when Jesus, their Messiah, would come. And the author is saying that day is here. Jesus has come. And, and he makes even a reference that he's made again in chapter 8 and Jeremiah chapter 31. I will put my laws on their heart that we see again here in 16 and 17. And so everything that they were looking for, everything that their worship practices were helping, supposed to be helping them point them to, has come. And it's found in the name and the man of Jesus Christ. He is the only one who can and has sufficiently dealt with our sins, with their sins. And rather than go back to elements of worship that cannot lead them to Jesus, that would actually be a detractor, he wants them to focus on acts of worship that will lead them to Jesus and to provide for them reminders of the things that will help keep them focused on him. And I think that's also an important lesson for us, an important takeaway today for us. Sometimes we fall into practices that are more traditional than they are biblical. Our, our world around us has lots of things that we've put in place. They're just really good things. And yet some of those things become the thing that we worship rather than the the person that they're supposed to lead us to. And so this is, a, this is a challenge for us when we think of, well, I just like worship this way, or I like this element of worship, and I like this thing that helps me draw near to God. I, they can be good things. But when we start fighting or the church starts arguing over things versus the focus of what it's supposed to bring about, We've missed, and we fall into the same category as these Jewish believers in Hebrews, because they were looking at practices and wanting to go back to practices that they thought would lead them to God, but it's really not, because Jesus is the focus of their faith now, and those systems were but a foreshadowing. They were the beginning stages of God's continual work through time and through history 
to bring, this, bring them to this point of realization that Jesus Christ is our all-sufficient sacrifice. He is seated at the right hand of God, and one day he will return. And so everything uh, that you do in life and worship must point you to this truth of Jesus Christ. All-sufficient sacrifice, eternal King, Lord and God. Now, again, what does this look like in practice? Well, sometimes we can look at, well, what we do on a Sunday morning or what we do on a daily basis. Hey, you know, the, the, the scriptures speak of how everything that we do, let it be an act of worship. And so for them, it was really taking a direct attack at their processes, at their festivals, at their sacrificial systems that they considered worship. And I think here's, here's the next jump I'm going to ask us to make as I think this text brings this out. For them, they would choose the, the right sacrifice, the perfect sacrifice. They worked really hard at raising up these bulls and goats and lambs and doves, and they were, they were just doing everything they could to make sure that they did everything to make sure their sacrifices were accepted. Their, uh, their whole process about observing the festivals, observing the laws of God, was. Uh, it's very easy for me to see them doing it as a, hey, I'm doing this right, and so now God has to oblige. He has to respond in a certain way because I'm doing it just the way it's supposed to be. And yet, the sacrifices and the laws and the processes that God had set up for his people were never supposed to intend to give the people some badge of merit to make a claim on. It was intended for, their, their, for the people to understand that the focus is about responding to God in his leading, responding to God in his forgiveness, and, and if, I, if I do it right, I'm not earning it, I'm responding. And so I think it's easy for their worship to be very focused on self and their ability to earn forgiveness, when all along it was really just to remind them of the consequences of sin and the favor of God. And I think for us today, church, we fall into much the same thinking at times. When we think about our offerings that we bring, when we think about our times of service that we give in the church, when we think about our church attendance, and when we think about all the things that we do or that we bring to God, I, I think it's easy for us to lose focus in the fact that Jesus is all sufficient, and our response to that truth is that we do these things. We worship God out of response to his favor towards us, to the fact that he did send his son to be our all-sufficient sacrifice, to save us. And I think there is a response to that. And primarily the gospel, we would be remiss if I don't mention this, our initial response that God has clearly laid out for us in the gospel is that of faith. For those who believe upon Jesus Christ shall inherit eternal life. If we confess that he is Lord and God, if we make that proclamation, we find that there is forgiveness. When we repent of our sins, when we turn away, when we're baptized, when we're joined in the waters of baptism, the scriptures speak of that joining with Christ, the unity that comes in Christ, and also the cleansing of our lives of sin. These are our initial responses to what God has done for us. But then there's plenty others. Uh, those are our initial ones. But I, I think when we study the scriptures, we see there's responses like church attendance. <laughs> because as we'll learn as we continue in Hebrews, we, we can't forsake the gathering. There's power in the gathering, and the church gathered. It's, it's part of this 
focus of worship for our lives, to come together and then to scatter into the world and come together and be encouraged and to attribute honor and glory and praise to our God, but also then to, to scatter and to share the truth that we've learned to the world. It, it, it might look like giving to others, to giving to the church and advancing, but it's out of response of everything that God has given us. It might look like fighting for biblical marriage or protecting the fatherless and the widows because these are things God has set up as as foundational truths in his word. And maybe it looks like spending time in study and growing an understanding of God's word because that's important. It's an important principle taught to us throughout the scriptures. It looks like praying for one another, lifting one another up, going to battle in prayer when there is need, spending time praising the Lord when there is joy and, and praise that is worthy of his name. What other practices, what other things look like worship in our life that we see presented in the scriptures? Or do we just kind of do those things to check a box and because that's well, going to earn some right for God to look upon us with favor. I think this passage of Scripture takes direct aim at the heart. And it's good for us to evaluate our actions, just as it called those early disciples to evaluate why they wanted to go back to a process that would never lead them to the all-sufficient and worthy sacrifice of Christ. And yet, like I said when we started There's so many things, so many good things that God has given us. And yet we find ourselves sometimes forsaking the body, forsaking his words. All because, well, we're not in danger of persecution necessarily, but something looks a lot more fun. And is that really the response that God seeks for us as his church? It's all about responding to what God has done. They responded because God had dealt with their sin. And I think our response should be the same. So what's your step to this week, this day? Well, what's the proclamation? Do you you believe, first of all, that Christ's sacrifice is all sufficient, or are you still trying to earn your own way? Trying to just do a few more things to make God look upon you with favor? Or is it just out of response? Um... Have you responded to Jesus Christ? Do you believe that he is the all-sufficient sacrifice worthy um, of our worship? Uh, If not, we want to ask you to wrestle with that. Um, Spend some time with uh, myself or one of the elders, with uh, another godly member of the church here, just really wrestling with that truth because this makes an eternal difference. makes an eternal difference. And if you've made that decision, well, as a church, when it comes to our actions and our responses, the things that we do, is it really because, well, we're checking a box or are we responding to God's all-sufficient sacrifice? Are we sharing the gospel because, well, we feel like we have to, or we should, or because we truly believe that God has sent us on a mission and he's desperately seeking to rescue those who are destined for eternity in hell apart from him when he desires us to share the news so that they can spend an eternity with him. Uh, Just go through your worship practices. What have you set up? And are they leading you ultimately to Christ or are they just leading you to more busy work? You're the only ones that can answer that question. And if you need help, we can always sit down and wrestle with that together. Let the church do what the church was intended to do. Let iron sharpen iron. Um, so what's your response? Maybe it's a forward to ask some questions, spend time in prayer, or maybe it's out there to make a difference in the world. I'm going to invite you to that. I want to say you're, if you're able to stand, you can, we'll pray, and then uh, go be the church. Uh, Father, thank you for this truth that your sacrifice is all sufficient and it's eternal. It was, it was a, a single offering done once for all time, and you're seated at the right hand of the Father waiting for that command 
to return. Uh, Father, thank you that we, uh, we can see your hand moving throughout all of time and history and, and even the law, as good as it was, it, it reminded the people of their sin and your, your sovereignty and, and the consequences of sin, but also, Father, it was a foreshadowing. It was a, a, a dim glimpse of your ultimate work that you did through your son Jesus on the cross. And for that, uh, Lord, we thank you for your work. We thank you for that amazing picture of sacrifice, that amazing picture of power where sin was dealt with. It was sealed up in the tomb. It was dealt with through Christ, but that you have risen. And Lord, I just pray this week that in all the things that we do, uh, Father, if they're not things that will lead us to uh, worshiping you or leading our lives to be focused on you, that you would help sift us. Uh, Father, I understand there's things that we have to do to, to earn a living and, and care for our families or kids or just whatever it is you put it under our care and responsibility. But even those things, Father, they can, be a, they can be an instrument and a way, an avenue for us to glorify you, to worship you, and to accomplish your will. And so, Father, may you use everything that takes place in our lives to point others to you as Lord and Savior who has sufficiently dealt with sin. But bring about an awareness that there is a response that needs to be made. And so, Father, help us to respond appropriately and and others who are far from you to respond ultimately for the first time into surrender. Uh, Father, may you move and work as you see fit this week in our lives. I know that's a dangerous prayer, but Father, we, we offer it up knowing that you are in full control and worthy of our trust. And that you'll be with us in every step, whether that's something that takes us to a mountain high, joyful experience or the deepest depths of darkness that we may experience. We, we know that you're there and will sustain us through it all. And so, Father, thank you for this church, for this word that you've given us today. May you be glorified in our lives. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Have a great week.